Hi YouTube, it's Josh Miles and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be discussing another solved case for my Curious Case series. As I'm sure you've noticed in the title and the thumbnail, today's video and today's case is slightly different from the usual case I would cover. It's not a murder case, but to me it is just as interesting. Before we delve in though, I'd like to give a massive thank you to the sponsor of today's video. I'm sure you've heard of them before. They're called Hunter Killer. If you have haven't heard of them then you're truly missing out. Hunter Killer is a monthly subscription box that allows you to unleash your inner detective. Hunter Killer sends a fictional cold case to solve every month, leaving you to go through the evidence, decode ciphers, piece together the clues, and ultimately crack the case. Over the span of a few months, you will receive more and more clues that will aid you in solving the case. And not only are you solving a fictional case with your subscription to Hunter Killer, but you're also aiding in solving real cold cases. With each box sold, Hunter Killer donates to the Cold Case Foundation, which is a charity that, according to their website, is devoted to raising public awareness of cold cases and assisting law enforcement with whatever resources are needed to bring about closure. If you're interested in delving deep into a fictional cold case and putting your detective skills to the test, then be sure to click the link at the top of the description or the link in the pinned comment to go check out Hunter Killer. Or simply go to hunterkiller.com forward slash Joshua miles and use the discount code miles for 20% off your first box. Again, a massive thank you to Hunter Killer for reaching out and sponsoring this video. And with all that being said, let's delve right into this case. It was at approximately midday on Tuesday the 22nd of August 1911 that the most famous painting in the modern world would be stolen from the Louvre in Paris, France. Although at the time this particular piece of artwork was only really well known within the art community and it wasn't very famous outside of that community. But in a heist that would spring a relatively unknown painting into international limelight, boosting its value by over $800 million and causing people from across across the world to draw up crazy conspiracies of who might have been responsible, let's delve deep into the infamous 1911 heist of Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. I'm sure we all know what the Mona Lisa is, what the artwork is, what it looks like, so I'm not really going to delve into much detail about it, though it's important in the context of this case to take a brief look at the history of the Mona Lisa to ascertain its significance and importance prior to the heist. The painting was finished in the early 16th century and from that point until the 1860s it was largely ignored by the art community. It had started to gain a level of notoriety in the 1860s by art critics who viewed the Mona Lisa as being a masterwork of the Renaissance painting era. Leonardo da Vinci brought the painting with him when he was invited to Paris by King Francis in 1516. I believe that the French king bought the Mona Lisa after Leonardo had passed away from Leonardo's assistant, though some sources conflict this and say that Leonardo had given it to the king as a present or that he had, the king had bought it whilst Leonardo was in Paris, but for the, the majority majority of sources say that um, the king did buy it after Leonardo's passing. Regardless, the Mona Lisa, also known as La Gioconda, fell into the possession of the French royals where it remained up until the French Revolution. According to some sources, it went on permanent display in the Louvre in Paris in 1797. For those of you who may not be familiar exactly with what the Louvre is, it is essentially the world's largest art museum. It's also a historical monument in Paris. The Louvre started off its life as a castle before becoming the Louvre palace where the French kings lived until the French Revolution, where it was transformed into a museum. The Mona Lisa largely remained in the Salon Carré in the Louvre up until that fateful day in 1911. On the morning of the 22nd of August 1911, a French painter who went by the name of Louis Berrou arrived at the Louvre to continue to sketch the painting he was working on. 
The painting he was working on is called Mona Lisa au Louvre, and as you can see, it's simply a painting of the original Mona Lisa on the wall. However, when the painter Louis arrived to continue his sketches and continue his work, he wasn't confronted with the Mona Lisa as it should have been. Where the Mona Lisa should have been hanging on the wall were just four iron pegs. The Mona Lisa was gone. Louis went straight to the guards of the Louvre, which is basically the security, to try and find out where the painting had gone. And he was informed by them that the painting had likely been taken to the photographer's studio to be photographed as part of a campaign to uh, capture all the artwork in the Louvre. Consequently, Louis decided to wait just a few hours until the photographer was done with it, uh, presuming that the photographer would then return the Mona Lisa to where it should be hanging. Though, as the hours ticked by, Louis grew more and more concerned um, and he decided to go back to the guards and ask them whether they can go to the photographer's studio to see what the holdup was so that he could continue his work. But when the guards checked with the photographer, they discovered that the Mona Lisa wasn't there. The head of the guards immediately contacted the police and informed them that the Mona Lisa was missing. But of course, the police wouldn't really have been aware of what the Mona Lisa was at this point. So they would have just thought that a piece of art by a very famous uh, painter had been stolen, which is still quite a top priority, especially considering at the time the Louvre was operated and managed by the French government. Police and detectives rushed to the Louvre to begin their investigations. It was initially theorized that the Mona Lisa had been moved to another part of the museum, uh, maybe by a workman, but as a practical joke. After all, the Louvre is the world's biggest art museum and housed over 380,000 pieces of art in its public and private collections. The police and members of staff and detectives all combed through the Louvre to try and locate the missing piece of art. That was when investigators discovered the thick frame that had housed the Mona Lisa, along with its protective glass encasing in an employee stairwell. It quickly became clear that whoever had stolen the Mona Lisa, whoever had taken it, had been careful to remove it from its frame as to not damage it. Presumably the painting being too heavy and too bulky to sneak out of the museum if it were still mounted to the frame. When it became apparent that the Mona Lisa wasn't in the Louvre and it had in fact been stolen, the police turned their attention to a man named Guillaume Apollinaire. Guillaume had been suspected of being involved in the stealing of a multitude of Egyptian statuettes from the Louvre due to his links with Gérard Pouré, who is an artist that is very well known known for his thefts from the Louvre, from the museum. And the police decided that it was reasonable that Guillaume may also be responsible for the theft of the Mona Lisa. And so on the 7th of September, 1911, just a few weeks after the theft, the police arrested Guillaume. The police had arrested him on both the suspicion of stealing the Egyptian statuettes and also for stealing the Mona Lisa. Though in his questioning, he told the police that it wasn't actually him who had taken the Egyptian statuettes. It had actually his secretary. Guillaume then went on to implicate a friend of his who had previously bought stolen artworks from him and the secretary in the past. Who was this friend? None other than Pablo Picasso. Picasso was subsequently brought in for questioning and fearing that a conviction could end in his deportation back to Spain, insisted that he had never ever met Guillaume. Thankfully for both Guillaume and Picasso, both their alibis were strong and they had backing to him. Um, and thus, they were both cleared of having any involvement in the theft of the Mona Lisa. An American tycoon called J.P. Morgan was also suspected of having some kind of involvement in the theft, with some theorizing that he had commissioned a heist so that the Mona Lisa could join his extensive art collection. Though, just like with Guillaume and Picasso, this theory quickly fell through. Tensions between France and Germany had also begun to escalate during this time period, and some people began to speculate that the Kaiser had actually been involved in the theft. After all, the Mona Lisa was was seen by art critiques as being a masterpiece of the Renaissance period, a critical part of French history. So this theory could be viable, it could be plausible. And in some newspaper articles from the time that I read, 
the police did actually investigate the um, two suspicious German people who were seen around the Louvre and then were seen crossing the border, though this really came to nothing. Ultimately, the Louvre was closed to the public for a week while a team of over 60 detectives combs through the museum looking for any evidence. And when the museum's doors opened to the public again, people flocked to come see the blank space on the wall where the Mona Lisa should have hung. You see, as soon as the news broke that this painting had gone missing, the newspapers, which had just started becoming a more and more popular thing at the time, jumped on the opportunity to attack the French government, who, as I said earlier, owned the Louvre. For the lack of security of French historical artwork and, and for their incompetence. This forced images of the before unknown Mona Lisa into national newspapers. Before the hype and the talk of the missing painting went international. People from all over the planet were talking about the missing Mona Lisa painting. And just like that, the once lesser known Leonardo da Vinci artwork was suddenly the most famous and most recognizable piece of art in the world. Thousands of postcards and flyers and posters were printed with the Mona Lisa on it. And they were sold in shops across Europe and plastered everywhere. Everybody knew what the Mona Lisa looked like and they were aware of the painting, they knew about it. Newspapers began offering substantial rewards for any information leading to the recovery of the artwork, but it seems that the Mona Lisa had simply vanished. No traces of it could be found. There were mutters of it being secretly transported into Belgium and Germany and the neighboring countries, but nothing ever came of that. In their initial investigations, the police enlisted the aid of Alphonse Bertillon, who was now known as the father of the new science of forensics. Alphonse approached the crime scene with a surgical precision, and he was actually able to find two pieces of forensic evidence. The first was a smudged fingerprint on the Mona Lisa's wooden frame, and the second was a complete, intact, fingerprints on the glass casing that had surrounded the Mona Lisa. This meant that the police had a lead as to who the perpetrator might have been. The police subsequently ordered 257 people to submit their fingerprints to Alphonse for comparison. That 257 people even included the directors of the Louvre, though all 257 prints and comparisons came back as not a match. It wouldn't be until two years and four months after the heist that the truth of what happened to the Mona Lisa would come out. By this point, the police had exhausted all of their leads. They were getting no new information. And despite the massive rewards for information, nothing came to light. On Friday the 28th of November 1913, Alfred Giri, who was the owner of the Galerie d'Arte et Moderne, in Florence received a letter. The letter was from an Italian man who was going by the name of Leonardo, who claims to have possession of the Mona Lisa, and they had intended to sell it to Alfred. In this letter, Leonardo asked Alfred for 500,000 lira, which is the currency of Italy at the time. Alfred noted that the letter seemed to have come from Paris through the uh, postal stamps on the letter. Also in this letter, this patriotic Italian Leonardo character claims to have stolen the Mona Lisa in a patriotic act, as he felt it should have been returned to Italy, which is where it was painted. He went on to write that Paris shouldn't be decorated with the spoils of Italy. The fact that the Mona Lisa is also considered to be a very important part of the Renaissance uh, period further added to this Leonardo's claims. He wrote that Napoleon robbed Italy of all its riches and brought it all back to Paris, and that he was simply returning the Mona Lisa back to where it belonged. Although it's important to note that the Mona Lisa passed into French possession some 250 years prior to the birth of Napoleon. Leonardo also claimed in this letter that he would be unworthy of Italy if he hadn't returned one of Italy's masterpieces back to her. Upon receiving this letter, Alfred Giri contacted the director of the Florence Galleries as he wanted to try and get some advice as to what to do next. 
If he straight away reported it to the police, Leonardo might flee and they might not ever recover what he claims to be the Mona Lisa. And thus, Giri wrote back to Leonardo, entering heartily into Leonardo's proposals and his sentiments. A meeting was then arranged between Leonardo and Giri for the 11th of December 1913 in Florence, Italy. Initially, Giri didn't believe that anybody would show up to the meeting. He thought that maybe it was just all a big hoax. Though just as he began to doubt the authenticity of Leonardo, Leonardo showed up and he was carrying a big heavy wooden trunk. When Giri opened this trunk, he was confronted with just a few odd tools and paintbrushes, not the Mona Lisa, he was confused. Leonardo then revealed that at the bottom of this wooden trunk was a secret compartment beneath a false bottom. And when Leonardo opens the secret compartments, there carefully rested the now famous Mona Lisa. Alfred Giri stared in shock as he saw the subtle smile of the Mona Lisa before him. Somehow, Giri managed to convince Leonardo to leave the Mona Lisa with him so that he could have it examined by some experts to make sure that Leonardo's claims that it was the real Mona Lisa were true. And Leonardo agreed to this and told Jerry the hotel he was staying at in Florence because he had traveled from Paris to Florence to, uh, to this meeting. And as soon as Leonardo left, Jerry had some experts come in and examine the painting. They confirmed that it was the real Mona Lisa. And then they contacted the Italian police who went to Leonardo's hotel and promptly arrested him the following morning. Upon his arrest and subsequent questioning, this Leonardo character continued to spin his story of heroic patriotism. The detectives then uncovered the true identity of Leonardo, Vincenzo Perugia. Vincenzo was born on the 8th of October, 1881, in Dumenza, Italy. Not too much is actually known about his life, but what we do know is that he somehow found his way to Paris, and in 1908, he was actually arrested for assault as he had robbed a woman. For that offence, Vincenzo only served eight days in jail and was lightly fined. Though during that arrest in 1908, his fingerprints were taken and were placed on file. It is also reported that Vincenzo was arrested for carrying a firearm without a permit during the same time period, and when he was arrested that time, his fingerprints were also taken. At some point between 1909 and 1910, he found himself in the part-time employment of the Louvre as one of their glaziers. His job was to frame some of the most expensive pieces of art in the Louvre's possession and place a glass security box around them to ensure their safety. This meant that Vincenzo had an extensive knowledge of how to carefully remove the Mona Lisa from its framing, how to carefully dismantle the glass protective casing that was around it, and it meant that he knew how to do it very, very quickly. It also meant that nobody within the Louvre would be really that suspicious of him being there as he had often found himself there during his part-time work. When Vincenzo was asked to tell the investigators what had happened the day that the Mona Lisa had been stolen, he had told them that he entered the Louvre at about 7 a.m. on the morning of Monday the 20th of August 1911, the day prior to the day that the painting was found to be missing, and he'd entered the Louvre with a small group of workmen. You see, that Monday the Louvre was actually closed to the public as as it is every Monday so that routine maintenance and cleaning could be carried out throughout the museum. This meant that there were hundreds of workers going about their business in their white smocks, not really paying attention to anything else. It was a lot of people so you wouldn't know everybody there, everyone was just getting on with their job. Vincenzo had been sure to wear the same white smocks that the workers had worn so that he would blend in. He then made his way completely unnoticed, completely unquestioned to the location of the Mona Lisa. Vincenzo removed the painting from its hanging before taking it to a nearby service stairwell, which is the same stairwell where the frame would later be found by the detectives before carefully cutting the Mona Lisa from its frame. Framing. Now, Vincenzo then claims to have left the Louvre with the Mona Lisa concealed under his blouse. However, the door that he had wanted to exit through, his escape plan, when he came to open it, it was 
locked closed. Fortunately for Vincenzo, a plumber was walking through the stairwell and came across him struggling with the door. And upon explaining to the plumber that he had accidentally locked himself on the wrong side of the door, the plumber took out his key, unlocked the door and let him go through. Vincenzo then fled through the door and down some scaffolding that was on the side of the Louvre at the time and made his exit. He took the now famous painting to his flat, which was in a location where many Italian workers lived, and stashed the Mona Lisa in the secret false bottom of his wooden trunk. Following that, he went on to his place of work and continued on as normal, working as a glazier and a house painter. When he showed up to work a few hours late that Monday morning, he told his co-workers that he had simply just been hung over and that's why he was late because he was really hung over um, and at the time uh, in France at least in Paris Sunday nights was a very very popular social night with so many people getting drunk so this would, would be very plausible. It wouldn't be a story that anyone would question. Interestingly, a degree of suspicion had been aimed at the glaziers of the Louvre during the initial stages of the investigation. The police inspectors questioned all the glaziers and members of staff at the Louvre. And when they went to Vincenzo's flat about a month after the crime, he spun the same story of him only being late to work that Monday morning due to him being hung over because he'd been out drinking the night before, uh, just like, many people commonly did. Vincenzo even invited the police into his flat to inspect it and search it. Investigators decided and concluded that an innocent man wouldn't have so openly invited the police into their flats to search it, and so they continued on to the next person they had to interview. Fast forward to when the Italian police heard Vincenzo's confession. They asked the French authorities to question the workman that he had claimed to enter the Louvre that Monday morning and the plumber that he had claimed to see. And that was so that they could back up his claims. The plumber that had opened the door remembered having opened it for a man, which he thought was an official due to his white clothes and due to the fact that no members of public could be admitted to the museum on that day due to its closure. The two workmen which he had claimed to have entered the Louvre with on that Monday morning told the investigators that his claims were simply untrue. They told the police that they hadn't seen Vincenzo or anybody outside their regular group of people that morning. More holes began to appear in Vincenzo's story. He claims that he had entered the Louvre at about 7 a.m am but the workmen didn't enter the Louvre until 8.45 a.m. Investigators know that Vincenzo had shown up to work late at about 9 a.m. that morning, two hours after the 7 a.m. time he had said that he had stolen the Mona Lisa, which left them questioning one thing. Why would Vincenzo, who had so proudly confessed to the heist of the Mona Lisa, fabricate parts of his confession, unless he had something to hide. Further to this, the police found postcards that he had sent from London to his friends in Paris, which is suspicious as Vincenzo didn't have much money, certainly not nearly enough to travel to London. Investigators also discovered that shortly following the heist, Vincenzo's two cousins, Antonio and Giuseppe, had suddenly left their jobs in France and had returned to Italy, where they supposedly went to answer a telegram about an inheritance that they were entitled to. The police also doubted that a single man alone could have lifted the Mona Lisa from its hanging as it was really heavy in a thick frame. That was when two neighbours of Vincenzo were implicated in the heist. The two neighbours were actually brothers named Vincenzo Lancelotti and Michele Chancelotti. A further neighbour named Madame Clamagion was also arrested but later cleared of any involvement. Upon learning of the two brothers' arrest, Vincenzo Perugia confessed to the police that he may not have been entirely truthful in his original confession. He told the court in late December of 1913 that the two Lancelotti brothers had aided him in the heist. It's important to note that the trial of Vincenzo Perugia took place in Italy as the Italian law at the time stated that Italian citizens who committed crimes in foreign countries but who are arrested in Italy must be tried in Italy. There were heated conversations of Vincenzo being extradited to France to undergo a French trial as the, the crime had been committed in France and it was 
a uh, piece of art that was owned by the French government, but this conversation was quickly quashed. Vincenzo told the Italian courts that the Lancelotti brothers had been aware uh, of the execution and the planning of the heist. That was when the true story of the heist came out. The three men had actually entered the Louvre late on Sunday night during the museum's opening hours to the public, two days prior to when the Mona Lisa would be found to be missing. The three men hid in a closet in the Louvre and changed into white clothes, the same kind of white clothes that the workmen at the Louvre would wear. Vincenzo knew exactly what to wear. He knew exactly which closet to hide in so they wouldn't be disturbed, and he knew how to pull off the heist due to his frequenting of the museum as, as a glazier. Then, at about 7am on Monday morning, the three men donned in white went to the Salon Carré, where they took the heavy painting down from its hanging and together carried it to the nearby service stairwell. It was there that Vincenzo worked his magic and carefully cut the Mona Lisa from its framing. Contrary to popular belief, Vincenzo didn't actually hide the Mona Lisa under his blouse, as it would have been impossible. The artwork was simply too large for him. Vincenzo was only five foot three, so he wouldn't have been able to stash the Mona Lisa under his blouse without anyone seeing it. But the three men had already known that they couldn't do this, so the Lancelotti brothers had actually crafted a wooden box that they took with them on this heist that they would store the Mona Lisa in so they could conceal it. I couldn't quite pinpoint what exactly happened next, but it's theorized that when the plumber was making their way through the stairwell, the Lancelotti brothers hid with the wooden box that conceals the Mona Lisa as Vincenzo convinced the plumber to unlock the door and let them through before they all made their escape. Some sources claim that the men covered this wooden box with a blanket before boarding a train at a local station at 7.47 a.m. that Monday morning, the train being an express train out of the city, and thus the heist of the now most successful painting in the world was complete. Due to the Louvre being closed that Monday for cleaning, it took 28 hours before anybody noticed that the Mona Lisa had actually gone missing. But what the three men hadn't expected and hadn't anticipated was the media coverage that the heist would receive in the press. As I mentioned earlier, the press were quick to poke fun at the French government who ran the Louvre at the time, which obviously caused great embarrassment for the French government. Due to the almost overnight fame of the Mona Lisa, the painting became too hot to sell to anyone else, which is what they had originally intended to do. The three men then quickly changed their plans and parted ways, and Vincenzo stashed the Mona Lisa in a secret compartment in a false bottom of a wooden trunk in his Parisian flat, before continuing on as normal. Vincenzo's claims that he had taken the artwork in an act of heroic patriotism was at best not very convincing to the Italian courts. What's interesting is that it came to light that Vincenzo had tried to sell the Mona Lisa to the previously suspected JP Morgan and to various dealers in London, but had been unsuccessful. This explained how he had afforded to go to London, as it had likely been paid for by one of these dealers. The magistrate was actually shocked to learn of this and remarked how it was extraordinary that none of these dealers ever notified the police. Upon the Italian government reclaiming the Mona Lisa, they put it on a temporary expedition in Florence, Italy, where thousands and thousands of people flocked to come see the Mona Lisa. They were so joyous, some people even wept to see the painting. It was celebrated and rejoiced by the Italian people. It was also toured to Rome during this mini exhibition with Again, thousands and thousands more people coming to see the now famous Mona Lisa. On the 31st of December 1913, the Mona Lisa returned to Paris after being missing for two years and four months. One source claims that it actually returned to Paris on the 4th of January 1914, but I believe this period between the 31st and the 4th of January was just the time that it, it took to travel from Italy back to Paris. A lot of Italians actually protested the returning of the Mona Lisa back to the French government, believing that the Mona Lisa had been stolen from them and that it was a piece of Italian artwork that they should keep. Though it was determined by the Italian government that it was rightfully owned by the French government due to the royal family, 
purchasing it after Leonardo da Vinci's death. When the Mona Lisa returned to Paris, it was hailed by the French government as a momentous and celebratory occasion. It was ceremoniously received back in Paris, back into the Louvre. The public and the press flocked in their masses to the Louvre to see the Mona Lisa, where it remains displayed to this day behind protective glass and now bulletproof glass. Vincenzo was ultimately found guilty on all charges, but the Italian courts found that Vincenzo had to some extent acted with a ounce of patriotism, which in their eyes meant that he should receive a lesser sentence. Subsequently, he was sentenced to one year and 15 days for the heist, though he ultimately only ever served seven months of that sentence. Simultaneously to this trial taking place, World War I had also broken out, so the trial kind of fell to the back of the newspapers, everyone was focusing on the impending World War. This is a further reason as to why the French government made the Mona Lisa's return to the Louvre such a momentous occasion. They wanted to use it as a way to boost the morale uh, of people in Paris and in France. I couldn't find out what sentences the Lancelotti brothers received uh, as a result of their crimes and their part in the heist, though I imagine it would have been a similar short sentence. But the case doesn't end there. According to Wikipedia, in 1932, an article was published by a journalist named Carl Decker, which claims that a con man named Valferno had commissioned an art forger to make duplicates of the painting. These copies would have spiked in value massively due to the original being stolen. The con man then hired Vincenzo and the Lancelotti brothers to carry out the heist. Though this this article has no evidence and no real backing to it, but I thought it was important to note. One interesting conspiracy theory does surround this case though. Let me just remind you though that this is just a lighthearted conspiracy theory that I thought would be nice to throw in at the end of this video. It's nothing more, it's not facts, I thought it was just a funny theory that I came across during my research. The theory goes that Vincenzo hadn't actually returned the original Mona Lisa back to the Italian government when he had gone to that meeting and had instead gone to the meeting in Florence with a copy, a very, very impressive copy. The Italian examiners that inspect the copy hadn't seen the original Mona Lisa before as it hadn't been, you know, super, super popular and famous. So they didn't really know what they were looking for, um, the theory suggests, and they just thought it was the real one. Likely an oversight due to the excitement of the Mona Lisa being found, they just presumed it was real. As I mentioned earlier, the French government had been very embarrassed that they had allowed the painting to be so easily taken from the Louvre. To avoid any future embarrassment and to boost public morale, the French government paid off its own examiners of the artwork to say that the Mona Lisa that had been recovered was the real one. The theory suggests that the Mona Lisa that hangs behind bulletproof glass in the Louvre to this day, which thousands and thousands and thousands of people flock to see every month, is not the real Mona Lisa, it's a fake. And the real Mona Lisa is still out there somewhere. And that's everything that I have for you in today's case. Thank you again to Hunter Killer for sponsoring today's episode. Be sure to jump over to hunterkiller.com slash Joshua Miles and use coupon code Miles for 20% off your first box so that you can start your own detective adventure. Tag me in photos over on Instagram and Twitter of you using the Hunter Killer boxes and solving your mysteries and being detectives. I would love to see that. You can follow me over on Instagram at It's Joshua Miles and the same handle over on Twitter. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time that I post a brand new true crime video just like this one. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next case.